Hey guys, how's it going? In this video, we're going to look at electron energy level transitions. So let's get going. Now, it starts by saying that in order to understand how emission and absorption spectra are produced, we firstly need to consider how electrons move within atoms. The movement of an electron from one energy level to another is called an electron transition. It then goes on to say that electrons can move between energy levels by emitting or absorbing photons of electromagnetic radiation. And remember, photons are just particles of light. So firstly, we have photons being emitted. So it says when an electron drops from a higher energy level to a lower energy level, a photon is emitted as shown below. So here's your electron starting in an excited state, a higher energy level, and if it drops to a lower energy level, then it's going to emit energy in the form of a photon. And it says only photons with energies exactly matched to the difference between two energy levels can be emitted. So what this means is that the energy of this photon must be the same as the difference between these two energy levels. So this energy, take away this energy, will give you the energy for this photon. And that's because it's the energy that has been given up that's been released upon the transition has been given to the photon. We can also see the case for absorbing photons though. So it says an electron will move to a higher energy level when it absorbs the energy of a photon as shown below. So if you've got an electron in a lower energy level, you can cause it to be excited or raise it to a higher energy level by absorbing a photon. So if your atom absorbs a photon, then the energy from the photon can be given to an electron in a lower energy level and cause it to be excited. That is, move it to a higher energy level. And again, it says here only photons with energies exactly matched to the difference between two energy levels can be absorbed. So what we mean by that is that in order for an electron to be excited or to move from a lower energy level to a higher energy level, we need the photon energy to be the same between the difference between these two energy levels. Otherwise, the electron won't move between the energy levels. Moving on, it says it can be shown that the energy of an emitted or absorbed photon is proportional to the frequency of the radiation. That is, we can say the energy E is directly proportional to the frequency F. Or an equation that you'll get on the relationship sheet in the exam is E equals HF, where H is Planck's constant with a value of 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And you'll get that on the data sheet in the exam. So E and F are proportional and H is our constant here. It then says when considering an electron transition, however, we must take into account the energy difference between the two energy levels. And that's what we were just talking about earlier in order to emit or absorb a photon. So instead of just E equals HF, we can expand on the left hand side a bit in terms of the energy to make it E2 minus E1 equals HF, where we say that E2 is the upper energy level measured in joules, not necessarily the second energy level. E1 is the lower energy level measured in joules, not necessarily the first energy level, H is Planck's constant measured in joule seconds, and lastly F is the frequency of the absorbed or emitted radiation measured in hertz. And we've got some notes and top tips to look at here. So firstly, it says, note the subscripts 1 and 2 in the above equation can be replaced with the relevant numbers for the energy levels you are using. So what we mean by that is that it doesn't necessarily need to be E2 minus E1 here. That's just a general form for the equation. But let's say you were using energy levels E1 and E3. Then you would have here E3 minus E1 equals HF. Or if you were using energy levels E4 and E2, for example, then you would have E4 minus E2 equals HF. But if you don't want to bother writing in little subscripts there, what you could write instead is something like this. So it says, therefore, it is sometimes useful to write this as delta E equals HF, where delta E is the energy difference. So instead of writing E2 minus E1 or putting in the subscripts for the specific energy levels, you can just write delta E instead, meaning the energy difference or change in energy. We then have top tip number one, which says, when asked to calculate the wavelength of emitted or absorbed photons, V equals F lambda can be used along with delta E equals HF it can be useful to combine the two as follows. So if we start with delta E equals HF, if we rearrange V equals F lambda, the wave equation, for F, then we divide both sides by lambda to get F equals V over lambda. And if we replace F with the V over lambda, then we get HV over lambda, and that is equal to HC over lambda, where V can be rewritten as C since the speed of a photon of electromagnetic radiation V is the speed of light C. So because V is just our speed of light C here, we could write delta E equals HC over lambda. And this is really useful to remember when you're doing questions involving change in energy or difference between energy levels and wavelength instead of frequency. And notice how we've got two constants on the numerator, Planck's constant h and the speed of light c, where both those values are found on your data sheet. And lastly, top tip number two says from the above, we can conclude the following which will come in handy. So we can say that from this expression, we have delta e is proportional to f, that is, the change in energy is directly proportional to the frequency. So the bigger the frequency, the bigger the change in energy, or the smaller the frequency, the smaller the change in energy. So that's from this first part, delta E equals HF. 
but then we also have, remember, delta E equals HC over lambda, so we can say that if we ignore the constants, we have delta E is directly proportional to 1 over lambda. That is, the change in energy is directly proportional to 1 over the wavelength. Or another way of saying that is the change in energy is inversely proportional to wavelength. And that means, remember, for shorter wavelengths, we have a greater energy difference, or for longer wavelengths, we would have a smaller energy difference. And you'll see how we use these two proportional relationships in the questions in the worked example video. That's all for this video, folks. Thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.